Good morning. We're going to move into the next session because we are shockingly on time. So this is the furthest end of the summit that we've been on time in 14 years. We're going to try to stay on time for at least one more session and then we'll schedule go to hell. Um, I'm Michael Bracey, one of the co-founders of Future Music Coalition. It is always an honor to see all of our old friends who've come back for summit. It's always an honor to make new friends and meet new people. Um, we are really excited uh, about everything we're doing this week. Um, and I'm particularly excited about this next session. One of the um, you know, real blessings of, of doing this work for such a long time is to see uh, the evolution of the way that artists are engaging with community, the way that artists are engaging in activism and policy, the way that artists are actually going to Capitol Hill and going to regulatory agencies and actually uh, dealing directly with policymakers. And in this next conversation, we're going to hear some different perspectives on that very interesting kind of intersection of activism and art and social change and community building. We have uh, three artists who uh, are all going to be playing tonight at the Future Music Honors uh, event. Martin Pernas, Ceci Bastida, and Sean King. And to lead the conversation from Georgetown University is our good friend and our uh, partner and host here, Anna Chalenza. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thanks all of you for being here. Uh, I am sort of pinch hitting here and it's a true honor uh, for me to be here, mostly if for, be beyond them being fabulous musicians. Also because here at Georgetown University, a very big part of the educational experience here is social justice. A lot of our students get out into the city, they're very connected, um, and many are interested in looking towards the future, not just in music, but also in policy issues. So this panel on art and activism is very dear to my heart, and I think it's also very dear to the core of what Georgetown is all about. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to Sean, uh, and he has a few questions for the audience. Oh, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Sean King, and um, I'm here today mostly because, uh, specifically, I've worked on a project over the last year. Um, a friend of mine in Denver was writing a play about immigration stories, mostly about dreamers, uh, perspective from that young generation, and, um, and th this play was actually uh, monologues telling firsthand stories about their tales, being American. He asked me to do some music. He had heard a remix that I did of um, Aaron McCune's song called The Jailer. Jailer was a act, an activist song um, about, about a trip that these two were both on, I believe, in Nogales and Tucson. And so I did a remix. My, my friend was making the play in Denver, and he said, let's do some more music like that reached out to some friends and I started producing music with uh, Raul Pacheco, who's from Osomatli. Some of you may be familiar. Um, they've been around for about 20 years and he was gracious with his time and we became fast friends. And then Ceci came onto the project. Uh, we met in a coffee shop in LA and very quickly realized that we were gonna work well together and um, we've been able to do some songs that I'm very proud of, and, and they'll, be, they'll be on a record coming out soon. So uh, I think that's about it. That's, that's what I'm doing here today. Um, I've been to DC with Michael, and um, we've talked about this project to people on Capitol Hill, met with some immigration lawyers as well from Georgetown, and uh, thanks for having me, and on to Ceci. Um, that was a long, good intro. Uh, my name is Ceci Bastida. I am a um, singer, uh, musician from Tijuana, Mexico. Uh, I don't know if there's any Mexicans here. Whoa, really? Yeah, but that doesn't, that doesn't count. Um, anyway, I, I, I've been doing music for many, many years. I started off playing with a band called Tijuana No, uh, that basically uh, wrote and sang music that had to do with politics and social issues. Um, more than anything, immigration, um, being from Tijuana, uh, looking at the border every day really sort of inspired us and stayed with us. And I think anybody that lives in a border town uh, cannot forget that part, that it's part of who they are. 
Um, now I'm doing a solo, I've been doing my career solo now for the past, uh, I don't know, five years. And, um, and then, like Sean said, we met, we talked about the, the possibility of, of collaborating with music for, for this play about the dreamers, and I, I really, I, I was so interested in being part of it, especially because now that I live in Los Angeles, I get to see the other side of, of immigration. I see people, once they cross, what their lives are like, and that's also a very important thing that I want to address as much as I can. Martin. Um, check. Uh, my name is Martin Perna. I'm the founder of a, a New York-based group called Antibalas. We've been around since 1998, um, and I was also one of the founding members of Sharon Jones and the Dap Kings. So I'm part of this whole family of Brooklyn funk, soul musicians. Um, and we did the uh, music for the Fela on Broadway show directed by um, Bill T. Jones. So we've been doing that um, for the past 18 years. I also have a background in teaching. Um, several of us in the beginning of Antipalas were involved with um, a neighborhood charter, social justice charter school. And, and the music that we play, uh, Afrobeat music, is by its nature a political music in the same way that gospel music by its nature is a religious music. And um, we've struggled moving from the analog era to the digital era to maintain the same type of integrity of relationships with our fans, it's just in the industry in general. So, you know, we've, we've been around, we entered in the analog era, now we're in the digital era, and while there's all these possibilities, or we're told there are these possibilities, it seems like, um, you know, there's just as much of a struggle to kind of maintain that level of interest, that level of commitment. Why does this matter when everything is becoming cheapened. So, um, you know, those are some of the struggles that we're constantly dealing with, both in how we operate as musicians, how we operate as activists. And, um, you know, sometimes we just kind of retreat and say, the best activism we can do is keeping our community of 30 some odd musicians together because that, and it, you know, if that falls apart, then we don't have a base to do anything. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll leave it there and, and we can kind of revisit those topics and others when we uh, um, I'll just chime in for a second. Martine and I were, were wondering last night um, who we'd be talking to. So um, I guess the first question is how many of you are students here at Georgetown? And Good then, for you. <laughs> and then uh, musicians? Professional musicians from around the country, I'm guessing, for the summit. Um, and then... Uh, and then what would the next category be? Managers, managers, agents. Okay. I love that some of the artists also raise them for managers and agents. <laughs> okay. yeah, well, actually that leads me into the first question. Um, already to be a musician takes a ton of time, the training and everything else. Then many, I mean, I'm going to date you all, but you started it, Martine, so it's okay. Um, we all grew up in the analog age, and now it's a very different world, and for those of you who heard the panel right before this, it was very much about how do you connect with audiences, um, how do you, you know, through various media and this sort of thing. So what we're finding is m more and more hours of, well, of your days probably are being taken up with not just making music, but connecting to these global audiences and then reaching fans and all these different networks. How do you fit in activism and where does that fit in? How do you, how does that work in this, in this age of media? I think strategies are constantly shifting because part of it has to do with who your audience is already and who you might want it to be, and then your ability to bridge the gap between who they are and who you're trying to reach out to. And being a, a band that's been around for, this is, we're going into our 17th year, our audience has changed in the sense that, you know, a lot of folks who are our age have kids, they're not going out, there's younger people, but how have they found out about it? Do they know the backstory of the band? Do they know that we're an activist band or have they just come to us for the music and then are surprised when they hear these, you know, like, oh, they're actually saying something, you know, about, about something. So that, that can be, um, it's something that you can't just sort of figure it out in the beginning and let it go. There's a, f a few bands that I think have successfully had like an ethos that somehow that's just so drilled in and the fans can kind of carry that and plug in. But that's, being, being in New York and being a really diverse band, like we don't have a particular demographic. We have musicians who were born in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. 
And I don't know if there's any other band in the United States that has that. So that's a benefit. It's, a, it's, it's something that is really rich, but it's also like, gosh, how do, you, how do you connect with the concerns of someone that was born in the 50s and someone was born in the 90s? That's, there, there's so many different things. So a lot of it, right now, we're kind of going back to the fundamentals, which are the music. Like if we just figure out how to find the right metaphors to talk about what's going on and put them in the music, that's the one surefire way that our sort of vision and values will not be diluted or co-opted, you know, and then we can move forward from there. Because we've had some sort of periods of being very busy, being very inactive, and then being a 12-piece band. And, you know, some of us, like even in busy periods, are on food stamps. So then we have to go out and like hire ourselves out to whether it's the Fela musical or whether it's, you know, some RK Fire wants horns or, you know, bands who are making a lot of money so we can do that and come back and do like the stuff that we really want to be doing. And um, so it's an ongoing struggle, but like, look, we're, we're about to go on tour, record a new record. And a lot of it is just like, let's just focus on the music right now and figure out how to talk about, you know, when everything is messed up, <laughs> like, where do you start? And so that's, we're, we're just going back to songwriting right now and then using that as a new platform. But a lot of it is just figuring out the right metaphors. And I know with Sin Fronteras, that's a big thing. Yeah, yeah, I have to second that. I mean, it's really, it really, it's about the music. It's, it's always about the music. It's a music first and it's a music last. And you got to be proud of what you're doing. So, I mean, when I was looking into Ceci's music, I mean, I was just so thrilled because uh, it just the, the, the style and, and uh, Ceci's got a great voice. And, and knowing, knowing that we were about to embark on something that was going to be music first you know um i'm i'm like an ableton guy and i like i like making you know uh beats and, and i know that ceci uses that program too and so i already knew that there was a language musically that uh you know that we we're going to be able to write in spanish and and all these things that i wanted to do so the activism i guess was i like that word didn't even really um factor in in the beginning because it was more just like Okay, this is what's this is what's bringing us to the table now. Now we got to make some stuff. We got you know we got to produce. So I mean I I, under, I completely understand what you're saying, and I think it's true. True artists, you you write about and you sing about and you perform about what really means something to you. What you want to make a change or it's something that's touched you. But I know that you've also gone that extra step, and you have. And we can't get all policymakers to listen to our music and get the metaphors all the time. So I also know that there are times when you have to speak more directly and go to Capitol Hill. And I'm curious, how, how have those experiences been? Um, any advice for the audience as to kind of how to get the word out when you've got that 20 second sound bite somewhere? I don't, I don't think I can take that because I've never <laughs> been here. This is my first time here. I have not been involved with that part. It's your 20 seconds, go. <laughs> <laughs> so you. Um, it's, I, with, Future of Music Coalition, sometimes just myself and, and one or two people from FMC, and then other times with a group of artists. We've gone to Capitol Hill, we've met with legislators, legislative reps, we've met with commissioners from the FCC, we've met with folks from the Copyright Office, we met with uh, President Obama's main immigration uh, czar, helper, <laughs> assistant. Um, and. Uh, and so it's always, it's always really exciting to have that face-to-face -face thing, because just like in music, life is based on personal relationships. And even though the population of the world keeps on growing, it makes the personal relationships even more um, important. And not on like, what can, I, what can you do for me? What can I do for you? But how can we connect as humans so we can actually hear each other's truths? You know, so that's a lot, it's a big, it's a tall order when you're going to the FCC and you've never met these people before and they have their ideas about what you do, you have their, your own ideas about what they do or don't do and how can we just cut through all the BS and say what we're here to do without an agenda. Like you want to do your job hopefully in the way that serves the public and we want to do our job as artists and as activists. Um, so it's rewarding, I think, and, and so few artists actually get into those spaces I feel like one artist going there and showing their face is worth 10,000 emails that you can click on. Like it's, it's really important to show up. It's really important to show up. But then you have to show up and be well read. And, and being um, informed in this time is sort of like you need to read less and read more. Like, <laughs> you know, you have to focus and filter a lot more. Yeah. Because you could spend 
all day and all night reading about something or on the net reading and, and, and not actually be more informed uh, about the things that, that are important. So that's a challenge to sort of not confuse constantly, abs in the, the constant intake of information for actually being informed, you know, and that's, that's tricky. Yeah. Does anyone have a question in the audience? There's a, there's a mic, actually we'll start right here. There's a mic right up there if you wanna go. And, um, and if you have questions to stand like this way, we can kind of keep track of where the conversation is going and we can fill in questions in between. Yes, please, go right ahead. Hey, um, my name is Elena Lacayo. I have a band here called Elena and Los Hulanos. Um, we do bilingual music. I actually come from like the activist background and I actually quit work in activism to do music. Um, and I, th uh, I have a few activist -y songs, but um, my question really more remains around how I find myself conflicted with um, certain values that I, f I felt um, I could be more in touch with when I was doing the activist stuff. Now I'm like a business person and I have to kind of operate with the powers that be a little bit more just to like sustain my life. And so, I mean, just, I just want to give an example. So I'm actually from Nicaragua and I'm actually going to go down there and we're going to do a second CD release for an album we just put out. And I have all these now, like the way things work down there is corporate sponsorship, which is not at all the way like things would work here. So I just, I guess, you know, I feel a little bit conflicted about some of that stuff and like making sure that I'm true to my values. Um, I don't know, I just guess I, I, I have, I, that's the question is like, how, how do you deal with that or have you, has that come up and how, like if there, you have any advice for? I someone? mean, I don't think I have an answer to that, but I've encountered the same thing that you're talking about. I think sometimes you have the opportunity to play at a great festival where you're gonna reach a lot of people and then, and I just did one in LA and next to the stage it said Toyota and, and, and bummed me out. And, and they, you know, and there were Red Bull ladies serving, discussing Red Bull to people. And <laughs> you know, it makes you feel uncomfortable but at the same time, I need to use that space um, to express what I feel and what I'm, what I'm about and try to maybe ignore for a little bit all of the other stuff. It's hard because it seems like I'm, uh, like I'm a, como una contradicción. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a hard thing. But then if you, tr sometimes, I feel more nowadays, uh, you see sponsorships everywhere. I don't remember, going back to the, the old times, you didn't see that. It's kind of like the new way and you know, like Coca-Cola will, you know, sign you or whatever. And it's just a crazy mix. And it's, it's a hard thing to sort of deal with. Um, and so I, I, I guess the only thing that I've done is try to stay away from the stuff that I really am against, like McDonald's and stuff like that, as much as I don't like having Toyota next to my face. I, I gotta say too, um, I, think it's, I think it's a case by case basis because uh, the band I play in is called Devachka and we've been really fortunate to uh, in, have some songs put in some movies and then that that causes this chain where some advertisers like will come and so it's a case by case basis. It's like, okay, here's a Gerber commercial, a woman's giving birth and this, okay, that one's good. Uh, here's another <laughs> Gears of War is a video game people are playing, is killing, is a game, so it's okay, that one's okay. But like, you know, it's uh, at, at every step, like that, some of those licenses made it so we didn't have to go on the road as much, which meant I get to, I was able to like start this project and work on a different record that's kind of, I mean, I think it's just case by case and, and we all go through it because now, like you say, all these stages are sponsored, especially in, in South America, I mean. Yeah, and, and I also think, I always think about this band from Mexico who started off when the labels were huge and there was no real independent labels um, Café Tacuba, oh, yeah. and that is a really good example of a band that doesn't necessarily talk about social issues in every single song. They do in some, but not in all. But they've never done a sponsorship. Like, they've never taken sponsorships from, from anybody. And they've managed to keep their career going, but they were signed to a huge label, for example. So that's also like, you know, people might have issues with that. Um, they became huge, and now they sort of can sustain themselves and don't need these horrible companies throwing money at them because they're doing okay. But I, 
but nowadays, it's so much harder. It really is. Martin? Yeah, just to echo that, um, I've actually lived and, and worked as a musician in Nicaragua, and it's really hard, on the Atlantic coast in Bluefields, oh, which is even harder than Managua and other parts. But anyway, uh, you have to set your standards really, really high and then negotiate back down, you know, like, like anything. So no to everything and then maybe to some things and yes to a few things rather than, you know, I, I'm going to say yes to everything because if you say yes to everything, people will take advantage of you and you really lose sight of what's important. Um, and to echo uh, Sean and Ceci, like I, I'm in a lot of situations that just really gross me out and bum me out. And it's definitely a more of an increasing trend. And I think part of it w is echoed by a friend of mine. Um, I lived in Austin for the past couple of years and so I saw the really... Uh, the mutation of South by Southwest over maybe 10 years. And a friend just very succinctly wrote on um, uh, Facebook, I discovered some really cool brands this year at South by Southwest. <laughs> and it wasn't a typo. And, and he's met it completely <laughs> facetiously. You know, he went to see bands, but it was like brands have replaced the bands. And, and the... And, and, um, Brands use the bands to create this reason for going out. It's the bands that are creating something fresh. And the brands are picking back on that. And I think in all of these different, um, we, we have this je ne sais quoi, this like magic. And they don't. And they realize that they need our magic to sell whatever it is that they're doing, whether it's an app or a font or a, a, a type of whiskey. <laughs> and, and, but yet we have less power to advocate for ourselves because anything, for starters, like the, the, the value that people put on music is shrinking, so we have less money for our own self-determination. And the state is being ho is a hollow shell, like all the ways that the state should be providing for culture and the arts for a healthy society, that's becoming hollowed out. And so, you know, the people who are stepping up for that are, brand, are corporations who are like, okay, yeah, sure, we'll give you some money, but make sure that we're getting more out of this than you are. And it always feels like that. Like, okay, maybe we're playing to 20 or 30,000 people, but there's way more people seeing the actual logo of the sponsoring entity than they are seeing the people who created that. So can I ask a question then to, to circle, bound, circle around with this? So we, we're, we're talking about some complaints we have and things, you know, times when you felt as though you had a message to say and maybe it was being corrupted by this or that. What about moving forward to the next step? So is there a way through our own activism that we can make a change? Because new companies are being formed all the time. So also part of this, I think, is about education and getting the word out and to those people who might be creating a company and seeing it from the artist's point of view. I mean, sometimes you can lure someone and I mean lure in a positive way, you can lure someone in with amazing music that touches them, so then if you have a message about maybe there's some reforms that we need to do, be it with net neutrality or copyright, but even moving forward with, shouldn't a, a music festival be about bands and not brands, this sort of idea. And I'm wondering, is, are there ways that you see that one could do that? Is it a local level? Is it making a difference with you know, independent companies versus these large corporations? I'm just curious if you all have any thoughts about that. One of the, I think one of the things that is definitely positive is that smaller cities around the country that have been really crushed by um, industrial you know, outsourcing and, and, and stuff like that, seeing um, local scenes develop. Because there's not very much money there, but there is relationships. And whatever happens out of that, whether the music is great, whether it stinks, the fact that people are getting together in their town and not feeling lame about not being able to move to LA or New York. They're making it happen right there. And there's so many possibilities coming out of that. And when people can organize to put on rock shows or hip hop shows or jazz shows, they build the tools to organize for climate justice, for, you know, about environmental racism, about all these other things. So I think that's the most exciting thing is to see local scenes develop in places that are not on the coast or not in, in big cities, because that's where you develop the skills and the chops to be part of a movement. And so that, yeah, I think that's one of the brighter, brighter things going on today. Yeah. Do we have another question? Uh, uh, hi, uh, I'm uh, Joel Pomerantz. I'm involved with the Electric Maid uh, here in town. Um, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just wondering uh, as far as dealing with 
the income st uh, stratification uh, and just sort of the challenge that I'm seeing here in the D.C. area, which is recently, recently studies have come out, it's the most expensive area in the country to live in. I've seen ba uh, bands and and songwriters leave this area in, in droves to move to brighter pastures because the, the living expenses are extraordinarily high. We have a very tight and supportive music community, but the living expenses are extraordinary. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just, you know, it's, it's just such a, a challenge. And sometimes, you know, in terms of everything that we're discussing as far as online you know, streaming revenue and whatever, it's sort of like rearranging the deck chairs in, in the tight on the Titanic mm -hmm. if if the if the if the ship is going down because of, of income stratification and 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 living expenses and just you know, I mean I'm hearing complaints about Brooklyn, I'm hearing complaints about Austin, right. stuff that's gotten back to me, you know, so I'm just wondering how people stand on all that. Thanks. Yeah, so how do you stand on I mean, you are you live in various areas. What do you think about this kind of connection between those who have the money who can live in the area versus those who are trying to create an art scene in an area? Is that the art? I mean, well, it's an interesting thing. Um, I I've lived in LA for the past eight years, and I moved to this area called. It's really close to Highland Park, and Highland Park is a very much Mexican or Latino. Uh, huge community, working class, and it's great. Uh, it's, it has its gangs, but it's it's good. And um, but I think it it happens everywhere. Artists start moving because it's cheaper, obviously. Um, then others follow, and then it becomes like a different a different community completely. And then the old community community needs to start moving out because they can't afford it anymore. So. I think that's what's happening everywhere, and and I, I always have mixed feelings about this this gentrification thing. I, like I, I like that you know that there's a little bit of variety, but in the end, I just don't think, I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's fair that these people that have, that have had their lives, that have been living there for so many years and generations, all of a sudden feel they need to move somewhere and find another place to live, because these other people come and they can afford it, and then they can't afford their own home. So, I is that. Kind of what you were talking about? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it makes me feel really weird about it. <laughs> it's, it's crazy, right? Yeah. It's, it's happening pretty much in every major city. And, and I think there's a really cynical element now that after having seen the forces of gentrification following artists, there are speculators. Uh, property developers, real estate agents who are like, yeah. okay, <laughs> if I want to follow the uh, money, I actually follow the musicians. It's not that they have money, but they have this alchemical, and not just musicians, but visual artists, filmmakers, performance artists, dance. Um, I was in, I, I lived in Williamsburg, Brooklyn from 93 to 2001. Now Williamsburg is one of the most expensive uh, neighborhoods in the city. It used to be, when I lived there, one of the cheapest. And it was, I lived in a building with uh, the same apartment with the guys in TV on the radio and Sharon Jones and the Dap Kings. And all that stuff was born in like the same 700 square feet. That could never happen now. You know, I can't, we can, it turns my stomach to go back into this neighborhood that was our, our um, uh, you know, we helped make it and we taught there, we had relationships. I don't know anybody who lived there anymore. So it's very alienating. It's become a really alienating process and it's almost like you don't want your work to be so good that people actually come to your neighborhood. like. And, and it's weird looking back Reverse into history, activism. like, I, I was, were we some of the shock troops of gentrification? That wasn't our intention at all. We were just trying to make stuff happen and make it happen at, in a community level. And then all that's co-opted. So I don't think there's a strategy for that unless the gap is bridged that give people, um, artists and just working people in the neighborhood, the means to buy their own properties because mm -hmm. the handful of people that were able to stay yeah. in those neighborhoods somehow had money for a down payment and enough people who knew how to navigate those strategy uh, New York real estate or DC real estate so that they could stay fixed because we you know exactly. we're constantly um, when we're de fully devoted to our craft we don't have anyone looking out for our interest of utilities roof practice space performance space you well, know and it seems to me that this is something that 
I mean, granted, there's some neighborhoods this has happened to in gentrification, but there, I mean, I live in Baltimore, and so a lot of the DC artists have been moving to Baltimore. So Baltimore is a great scene right now. But one of the, some of the conversations that are happening are how do we make sure that we can keep a sustainable arts initiative? And I know in certain cities like Denver, there have been real thoughts about, okay, if we're going to rebuild a part of the city, how can we make sure there are art spaces? How can we connect to education stuff? So I mean, I think that's an important part of our activism as well, not just looking back at things that went wrong, but going, okay, we've learned from that as musicians, so now in this next city, how can I make a difference with that next step? So going back to that Highland Park example, <laughs> one of the things that happened was the New York Times picked it as like the hippest neighborhood in LA. So that kind of messed us up a little bit. And then um, you'd see things where it'd say, if you want to take a road trip and have a nice meal, go to Highland Park within LA, because people were just not connected to it at all, and all of a sudden just people's eyes are on it, so it's, it's a little strange. Yeah. yeah. So we have one other question up there? Yeah. Um, so for uh, new up-and-coming artists who may not have um, a whole bunch of offers for licensing and endorsement deals and things like that, what is your advice to them to sort of balance between staying true to their values and causes and also making a little bit of money? You know, and you don't have, you don't have a bunch of different choices that you can sort of pick and choose in order to uh, not be poor and pay your bills. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I would say it goes back to being true to the music first. I mean, if you have something to say and, it's, and it happens to be, if it's going to be, uh, you know, you write a song about something that's really bothering you and, it, and, and someone brands it as activism and doesn't want to, you know, if, if they don't want to touch that song from like a licensing point of view or whatever, I mean, that's, it's, I think it just has to be, you got to do good stuff first and, you, and that good stuff has to be within the music. You know, it's, it always comes back to that. Like, um, you make your best stuff and then I think the, the choices kind of have to build along the way. I mean, I, I, it's been a interesting road for me because I, Devotchka hasn't necessarily been like an, uh, I wouldn't say an activist band by any means, but but we've we've been able to you know make our songs get out there, do a lot of touring and stuff, and then things kind of came up on the side like opportunities, like um, you know being able to write an op-ed an op-ed piece that that the Denver Post picks up because oh it's that band like we we are we will pay attention, so sometimes you have to go out and get attention first. And then, then do the other stuff later. I mean, at least that's that's how it's that's been for me. I don't know. I think it's it's different for each artist. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've turned down a lot more licenses than we've accepted with Antibalas. We've accepted like two, and turned down probably twenty or thirty, um, including some film stuff like a Chase Bank commercial, Grand Theft Auto video game, which sells millions of copies. It was like stuff. Cause it feels like we're digging we're digging our own hole. Like if we stand against if, if, if we are trying to look for alternatives to capitalism, then we can't do a Chase Bank commercial, even if we're broke and we need to pay, <laughs> exist in the capitalist system now. Um, or we can't, you know, if we're about peace and, um, and nonviolence, we can't give our, we can't turn our music over to Grand Theft Auto so it's, you know, someone's soundtrack for virtually running over people and shooting them in the street. Like, you really have to figure out where you're at. And knowing that if you say no to that, they'll just find some other schmuck that does need the money and cares less about integrity to do it. And, and you have to make peace with that. It's, it's, it's not a good feeling. It's not a good feeling like, okay, if we had taken that, our situation might be different. But ultimately, you can't ever take that back, you know? It's always better to sort of regret not doing that than to, than to do it and then be like, oh, you know what, that's... And have that shame. Yeah, yeah. But I think what you're talking about is also because Antibalas has been playing for a long time. You're, you're talking about someone who's new, right? right? Who pe people's mu who people don't know your music. Right. I think it's what Sean said. Just try to, you know, show it to people. Um, my Spanish is not, very, my English is not very <laughs> good today. But just like try to be present as much as you can. Keep putting out music and show it to people, and maybe somebody will hear something and then say, "Oh, okay." The other thing is there's so much, now with, with independent media, there's so many people who are making student films, documentaries, stuff for YouTube that want relationships with people who are creating yeah. new music. 
you know, so that's a really good way to sort of build, get your stuff to another platform. Sh you know, look out, and, and maybe there's no money exchange, maybe there's a little bit of money exchange, but there's a relationship built, and there's synchronicity. And every time that you have a positive experience with some, someone or a group of people, more positive things happen with that. So I'd say there's, there's plenty of people who need music for whatever it is, whether it's a film or a dance performance. And rather than just kind of being like, who wants to buy this, who wants to buy this, and, and on your knees looking for a license, um, that. But at the same time, you pointed out, licensing is so much of a bigger slice of the pie, percentage-wise. So if you're the type of band that actually has ethics, you know, that doesn't mean, even though that's bigger and bigger for artists in general, if you're really particular about who you get into bed with on the licensing thing, that you, you're probably not making that much more money. So we're, that's not, licensing is not a significant part of my income stream. You know? I, I got to say, I think what Martin said about, it makes a lot of sense to me to know, as a young band, know how to say no. I mean, we've turned down a Devotchka, or, or we turned down a, a McDonald's commercial, it was like for a McRib and they wanted to use this romantic song. And, uh, and we just, we labored over it for the longest time. It's like, okay, it's just a local commercial. They want to give us $600, which seems ridiculous. And it, it was like, it was like, no, but it's a McRib. It's like, and like, you know, while, while Nick is singing this gorgeous, gorgeous uh, melody, and we turned that one down. And, and but, then, but then there's more of that. And I think young bands have to, not be afraid to say no. There was another one that came out of nowhere. My manager called me one night and was like, hey, there's this new company, and they're like, they're like browser-based. Um, I don't even know what you call it, but it was like all I had to do was get on the internet for an hour and like take fans around to where I would click and where I would, you know, where I would mm -hmm. browse. And it was like, I can't remember. I mean, I think it was like a $1,000 check. I don't know. It was something like that. And I was like thinking about it all night. I was like, I really need that money. Like, I, I really need that money right now. Like, there's some piece of gear I wanted to buy. Who knows? But it, I was like, I, I woke up the next day. I was like, hell no, I can't do it. This is, this is ridiculous. Like, this, this would just make the band look so cheap. And, uh, and those, are, those are decisions you have to make from, from day one. I mean, you have to be able to say no. So we've got about three more minutes. I want to take the one last question here. Thank you very much for sharing your very inspiring trajectories. I had a question about the participatory aspects of this process from the communities that you represent. I help out and engage with an LGBT youth organization, and these kids seem to have a really low, the low barriers for creating music now and creating their own spaces and sharing their own stories. So I'm wondering if from how you create and collaborate, what that process is like, or what it could look like for especially young people who are just trying to do this more from an amateur side of things, but want to say something. Maybe we can close out with a comment by each. Um, we were, I was in a conversation last night about um, living room shows mm -hmm. and how there's so many more opportunities with social media to repurpose spaces intimate spaces for togetherness, for shows, whether it's people chip in and there's money involved or it's just a space to incubate, to share. And that's really exciting. I mean, that's the other thing, like even in big cities, some of the hippest music is not happening in a place that you can buy tickets to. It's happening in someone's living room and there's a piano there. So be creative. Don't necessarily um, attach success and legitimacy to getting a gig at the 930 Club. That's cool. But you can have a lot more, like, I played in Central Park last week with The Roots, Jay-Z and Beyonce for 60,000 people. It, it was not cool. It, it, it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. It wasn't a bad show. The Twitter is going But crazy. I've had way better, that's, if I had to compare that, like I've had way better experiences playing in someone's kitchen in Nottingham, England to like 40 people after the main show got shut down and we just all, there was much more spirit involved, you know? So that, if you can get the spirit going at a small level, you can ramp it up. But you can't necessarily assume that big people, like the spirit is going to be there just because there's 60,000 people there. You know? And that's the important thing. Um, but also I think connecting with musicians that could come by. I don't know if, if you guys play music already or you want to learn. Because I've been approached for, uh, by several organizations. I was involved with uh, Girls Rock Camp in L.A. 
and um, and I've been in conversations with Peace Over Violence, also uh, where they want to take young kids and have a work a workshop for like a couple of weeks and bring different musicians. So I don't know if that's something that you were interested in, but. It, it's so good for them, it's so good for the kids, and they just kind of get inspired and want to continue doing it, so that's another option. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is just with the young kids, just fire up those laptops, borrow laptops, get cheap software, you know, write beats, write chord, uh, chord progressions, sing over whatever, download stuff off YouTube and remix it, and like, there's just so much inexpensive stuff that you can get inspired by. And if I can just say one last thing to all of you who are musicians, who are connected to music anyway, if you could just connect with your local school, because if we get them young and they're excited about it, that's what it's all about. It's about the energy. So, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. All.